for us to come together as friends and family, to lift up your name and to praise your name. We thank you for everything that you've done in our lives, Father. We thank you for allowing us to come this morning. Father, I pray you just be with Derek as he brings the word and you just be with the worship team as we just praise, Father. We love you and in Jesus' name, amen.
one more time. There's no hiding from your face. There's no striving in your grace. God of mercy. God Almighty. Let there Purify our hearts in your fire. Breathe in us, we pray. Jesus, have your way. in your love There's no prison in your heart God of heaven God of freedom and There's no taking back the cross
comfort for all those who mourn for broken hearted sing louder the birds and birds and birds oppressed they turn in pray for broken There's no darkness in your way, so have your way. Lord, have your way. So alive. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star, a single fire of praise. The creation sings your praises so alive.
to have spoken. Nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath. down my heart, all of my failure and Where you lost your life so I could find it. If you left the grave behind you, so it lies. I can see your heart. Oh. 
Just sing your own praise to him this morning. for everything. Thank you for every opportunity. We thank you, God. Come on, let's give him a round of applause this morning because he is amazing in this place. You may be seated. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacob. For those who don't know me, I'm uh, Pastor Albert's son. He's currently in Mexico with my mother and along with uh, 12 other people from the church. They went to serve uh, for Regalos de Amor. Um, so if we could just keep, if you could keep them in your thoughts on their way back this morning and have a smooth ride. Um, my dad asked me to uh, introduce our speaker today. His name is uh, Derek Howard. He works in our sound booth. He's been my dad's friend for about 20, 25 years, and, uh, you know, my dad's really wanted him to come and serve at our church for all this time, and, you know, he finally came, and I know he's very near and dear to my dad's heart, and, uh, you know, with that, I want to lift him up. I hope y'all lift him up, and uh, Derek, come on stage. Uh, uh, I might, I might. Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Good morning, and Welcome. As Jacob said, we do have our team coming back from Mexico. I've seen pictures and videos, and I've heard great things about what's going on down there, what went on. Uh, but continue to pray for them, um, for traveling mercies on the way back home, that they'll return safe, because uh, we have a lot of our leaders down there. So, uh, you know, if, uh, if anything was to happen, then I don't know what happened to the church because the secretary's down there, all three pastors are down there, one of the head ushers is down there. So, so whenever they were leaving, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I was like, I better start praying because this, is, this could get crazy. Because I was like, Martine's going to have to run the church. Lord help us, you know. So, love you, bro. So, but anyways, like uh, Jacob said, uh, I have been a personal close friend of Albert's for about 25 years, and I thank God for that, because uh, Albert had, uh, had got saved, um, gave his life over to the Lord, and then about a year, year and a half later, my brother-in-law, Gilbert Sanchez, some of y'all will know him, he's, uh, one, he's over uh, the You Matter uh, Street Ministry, um, he gave his life to the Lord because of Albert, because Albert was sharing, you know, his testimony, what God is doing, what had, God had done in his life, and was able to lead Gilbert to the Lord. So, you know, I, uh, Gilbert and I were really, really close at that time, and so I was always hanging around. Now, I, I had, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself, because those of you that don't know me, um, You'll know a little bit more about me, probably more than what you want to know at the end of this service. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and continue on this story, and then I'm going to take off. But anyways, uh, Gilbert uh, gave his life to the Lord. And like I said, we used to hang out a lot together. So one day we went fishing, and you've probably heard Albert tell this story. So, but he never put a name to it, so I'm the name, just in case you've ever heard it. So one day uh, we go fishing, and we're fishing at a, a very nice uh, stock tank, so that way we can guarantee to catch something. And um, so we're fishing, and then Albert and Gilbert, their little excited selves, are standing over here, and they're just laughing and having a good time, sharing scriptures, you know, and spitting out scriptures, and I'm over here by myself, and they're over here, and they're catching fish after fish and having a good time, and me nothing. I have nothing going on over here with me. 
So I'm getting irritated. You know what I mean? And so I go, well, I know a scripture. Woo, I got a bite, you know, right away. And so they start laughing. And anyway, so that, that's, the, that's my fishing story with Albert. But um, my name is Derek Howard. I, I have been running the sound. So if you don't like the way it sounds here lately, I'm sorry. Um, but you can blame me. I'm also the low voice you might hear singing every once in a while on the microphone. So if you're looking up here trying to figure out where that low voice is coming from, it's not from Cece. It's from me. So, um, and I, I can't sing very well, but I do try. So, um, I am married. Uh, as of next year, it will be 25 years of marriage and 30 years together. I married my high school sweetheart, Cynthia, if you could please stand up so everybody knows who you are. It's my beautiful wife, Cynthia. So as I'm looking around the sanctuary, I do see people that we went to high school with, and I uh, see a couple right here on the front. Hey, all right. And uh, it's, it's kind of cool because they knew us when we first started dating, so it's kind of cool to, to, to continue to, to know people and have those kind of people in your life uh, after all these years. So like uh, Jacob had said, oh, I got, th- I got kids too. I'm sorry. I got, I got kids. I got kids. And they're all here, which is unusual. I've got my oldest son, Jonathan. Then I've got the middle child, as he calls himself, Caleb. And then my baby, Trinity. So, and they're all here. And then my mother-in-law and, and my son's family is here as well. So um, now I can go on. Okay. So anyways, I just want to share a little bit about who I am, where I came from, and what God's done for me, just so you will know me more than the sound guy. So, um, it, the good th- what I like about this church, what I like about Calvary Chapel, and, and, I mean, and he advertises it above the door of the sanctuary, I love my messy church. And I mean, and, and that's, that's what church is. Church is not, I mean, yeah, we, we have saints in the building, of course. But church is full of messy people. I mean, think about it. The Bible is full of messy people. So the church hasn't really changed after all these years. We are messy people, but we're real. We're real people with real problems, but we serve a real God. Just keep that in mind, Okay. That's what I love about this church is that I feel comfortable in here. I know where I came from. I know what God brought me out of, so I don't worry about it when I'm here. You know what I mean? I just feel like I just fit right in. I'm just another another fish in the stream. You know what I mean? Uh, Well, just to give you a little uh, back story of my life, um, I was the last-ditch effort to save a marriage. Um, I was the last child. I was the third child of three, um, and I failed miserably because my parents had separated months after I was born. So, I mean, that's the way I felt growing up anyway. Um, But also, what a lot of people don't know, and I verified these stories, although I was told all these stories growing up uh, from my father and my stepmother, um, I, I, I did, just for verification purposes, talk to my aunts yesterday because we had a, a family get-together for Christmas to go ahead and get that out of the way. And I was talking to my aunts and just verifying, right? And I thought to myself, wow, that really happened? That mean, really? Seriously? Man, I'm just more messed up than I thought I was, you know? So, but I was born with a form of cerebral palsy. And... I could not, I've got pictures to prove it, I just don't have them with me, my mom has them. Um, I was in a position where I was constantly like this and and drawn up. So I couldn't hold my head up. So when I heard that, I was like, what? No, was it? And then they're like, yeah, you were. And then my sister says, I think you still have some. But (laughs) that's my sister. So I don't even know if she's here. I invited her, I love her to death, but... Um, you know how you know how brothers and sisters are. So, uh, but miraculously, I had no idea. At uh, I think that we we decided it was around 18 months. That uh, well, th- I didn't know this. My aunt told me yesterday. She said they did a spinal 
tap on you because they didn't they weren't for sure if you had cerebral palsy a form of it or if you had spinal meningitis okay so they did a spinal tap on you and then the day after they did the spinal tap on you it was like <whistles> you just picked your head up and like we were amazed well during the time of this sickness my mom had left my dad left all three of us children with him I, it, it was just easier for her uh, and I know I'm not the only person in that situation where a family has been split up. Um, but I can tell you that I made the decision that I would never, ever put my children through what I had to go through. Because it's hard. It's really hard. So I made that promise to myself. So my mom had left, right? The strange thing about it is whenever she got word of my healing which is what it was, she got word of my healing, she came back to visit um, while nobody was home except for me and my stepsisters who were babysitting me. One was asleep and one was in the bathtub at the time I found out, and then I was asleep in the bedroom in the crib. My mom, knowing where we lived, I love her to death, I promise you I love her, uh, knowing where we lived, she came into the house, went to the room, grabbed me out of the crib, and passed me to my maternal grandmother through the window. And then I never really saw my dad or my brother and sister again until I was around 12. So it made it hard because growing up, I knew who they were. I knew who my father was. Um... But the whirlwind started, you know. My mom, she liked to marry, bless her heart. She was married after my father six other times. And uh, we lived in, babe, I've never really counted it. I just always just say the names. Seven different states in 12 years. Um, my California people that are here, I did live in California for a little while. I lived in the West Covina area uh, from kindergarten through fourth grade. I uh, lived in Florida, lived in Alabama, lived in New York, uh, Schenectady, so I think that's up north. What, there, no, somewhere. Hey, hey, okay. Hey, hey, yeah. How you doing? Yeah. So, my New York people over here. Although I don't have that accent. Uh, but, so I got to, you know, take a tour of the United States at, at a young age. Uh, you know, growing up like that, and, you know, I would, my, brothers and, uh, my brother and my sister, they lived in a nice home. We traveled from apartment to apartment, my mother and I. Uh, my brother and sister went to private schools. I went to whatever school was close to us. Um, whatever school that would allow me to go there and not kick me out. Um, so growing up, I had this extreme jealousy of my brother and my sister. I started to develop an anger toward my mother. It, I mean, it wasn't her fault, and I'll explain it later, because uh, I became to realize what was going on. But I developed this extreme jealousy and anger towards, uh, like I said, my siblings and also my mom. And I longed to be with my real father because I was being raised by these different men. And it would seem like whenever I got used to one, okay, he doesn't, he doesn't like for me to do this. He likes for me to do that. Uh, i got to pick this up, put this away. Okay. And then oh, another one comes along. Okay, okay, no, wait. And then I'd get to the point where we had, I had so many stepdads, I got confused. I didn't know what I was supposed to do for anybody, so I just rebelled. I just felt it was easier just to rebel. Well, when you rebel as a stepkid, it's not true in everybody's case, but it was true in my case that it has consequences because, you know, there was, there was physical abuse, there was sexual abuse, um, but there was nothing I could do about it. That was just the situation that I was in at the time. So I learned how to deal with that kind of stuff with with anger I was mean I was extremely mean um, I'm little so I had that little man complex right so the little chihuahua 
but you didn't want to mess with me because the thing was, I might not beat you, but I'm not going to get off of you. And you're not going to get me off of you. So um, I was in a lot of fights growing up, you know, and it's usually because I was the only white kid in the area, depending on where we were living. So I had to learn how to be, how to be tough. And um, I developed a, a facade to say, you know, I was fake. Um, everybody, I tried not to let everybody know what was going on with me. You know, I mean, they could see that something was wrong because of my behavior. But I tried to disguise a lot of it with humor. Okay? I'm a funny guy. I'm a funny guy. You know, so I've been told anyways. No, I, I know I'm funny. Sometimes I can be s stupid funny, but I, I, I claim to be a little bit funny anyway. But I like to make people laugh. And, I, and in the beginning, I would make people laugh just as a way for me to deal with what I was going through. It made me feel better by making other people laugh. But as I started going to church, as I started going to church, it became, I don't know, it was just something different. I could still make people laugh, and, and even though I was healed and I was feeling better, it, it, it didn't really do anything for me anymore except just make me feel good because I can make people smile or I could do stupid stuff and make people laugh, and I still do that. So if when, once you get to know me, I can be serious when I want to be. Uh, I do like to play around. I do like to joke around. I do like to make people laugh, right, Cece? Yes, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. Inside story. Inside story. So, um, but at the age of 12, I had came to the decision that I was ready for a change. Yes, I'm a 12-year-old, yeah, and I, I, and, uh, and I had that, that grown-up decision that I wanted to go visit my dad for the summer vacation. Uh, of, uh, I don't even know what grade it was in. Fifth, uh, it was after the fifth grade year, somewhere around there. And um, so I went to visit them in Dallas. And then when I went up there, I was like, man, this is pretty cool. They live in an actual house. All their utilities are on. Turn on the lights and the, you don't see roaches scurrying everywhere. Uh, you know, I have a brother and a sister. I've never had that. Well, I, I've had step, you know, siblings, but that was never good. Um, but it was cool because I'd never, you know, got to experience those things before, and I, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. So I talked to my dad, and I said, Dad, I said, how would you feel if I was to stay? He was like, son, I would love it, but I don't think your mother's ever going to go for it. I said, all right, well, I'll take care of that. And so I call her, and I said, Mom, I'm not coming back. She was like, okay. I was like, what? <laughs> okay all right cool <laughs> I hung up the phone right so no god bless my mom uh i later you know i thought she was always just fun to be around she was she was uh she was just like one of the kids you know what i mean it turns out that she was diagnosed with a chemical imbalance bipolar disorder and i never really noticed that until i got older you know, 10, 11, and then 12, I realized something's a little off here. Okay. So, you know, bless her heart. Now I understand, you know, looking back, the reason why all the marriages, you know, and, and why things just weren't working out, why we moved all the time. So, and I hold no grudges against her. I, I don't regret anything that happened to me at all. I don't regret the the beatings, I don't regret any of that because it is all part of who I am. It is all part of my testimony. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't. So I met my, uh, I finally came back to Waco, to the south side. I, I grew up a block away from University High School, so I'm a university graduate also, like Pastor. Actually, we went to school with Patricia. Um, I was baptized the same day as Patricia. I went after her, so I got baptized in her dirty water. <laughs> so, but I love her to death. So, um, but 
I was still angry. I had a lot of anger issues and at that time. And uh, one day, my wife and I had gotten an argument. We were young. You know, I was 17 probably at the time. She was 15, maybe 18 and 16, something like that. Um, we got in an argument. So I just took off, took off walking. That's how I cleared my head. I took off walking. And I passed by the recruiting station for the, the for the Marine Corps, and I said, "You know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell I'm gonna teach her. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna enlist in the Marines. <laughs> that a teacher right there." So I go in there and and I enlist in the Marine Corps, and he's like, "Son, we're glad to have you." And I leave. I'm like, "What did I just do?" <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh! So I went to the Marine Corps. Uh, thank God for that. That, that, was, uh, that was the first step for me, turning my life around. They were able to break me down to nothing and then build me back up to the where, where they wanted me to be. It, they got rid of my anger issues or they allowed me to learn how to focus and put them in other directions. And I thank God for that because that was, that was definitely a godsend, something I needed in my life. Um, it did change me in a lot of other ways as, as well. Uh, my kids will tell you, especially my oldest, that I'm a firm disciplinarian, you know, with my children. Um, he says uh, it's like growing up with a drill instructor, but it wasn't that bad. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so, but I'm hoping, you know, now that he's 26, uh, that he looks back and he realizes that it was all for his good because I did not want my kids to turn out anything like me so but I joined the Marine Corps and I did that and and I, and I had some you know fun with that I enjoyed it a little too much um, but it's what I needed the second best thing besides going to the Marine Corps and then marrying my lovely wife was I found the Lord and that is what finished my healing process from everything that I had gone through as a child. Um, you hear Albert talk about the early days when he says that we had uh, Bible studies and we would go to the park and there would be 20 or 40 of us there and then we'd go fishing together and we'd do all this. It was like we were the first uh, life group before even life groups came out. You know what I mean? We would get together... And then I loved it because we would, uh, Albert would be the leader of the thing, and, and he would get up there, and, and we would pick a book to, to go and read out of. And Albert just had a way of teaching the Word to where I could understand it. He put it in layman's terms, you know, where, where it just made sense to me. I'm like, Ah, oh, man, I've read that like a million times, and I never even got that out of that. That was, that was so, that was, that's cool, I like that, that's cool. So, uh, and, and, and we, we continued to do that for several years. And uh, the, the cool thing about it is I look back and I look at the people that were in that group. Uh, there are some that go to this church that, are, that were in that group. I don't see them here today. I know some of them were on the trip to Mexico. Um, but a lot of them either at one point in time were involved in ministry or they are continue to be involved in ministry today. And I think that is a testimony not just for Albert, but I mean a, a testimony of what can happen when a group gets together and they, and they get into the Word and they study and then they, they apply it to their life. So uh, I did get saved, uh, thank God. And uh, my life has never been the same since. Now, I would be lying to you if I was to sit up here and tell you that when you finally make the decision to give your life to the Lord, that all your problems are going to disappear. You'll never, ever face any more struggles the rest of your life. And if I was to stand up here and tell you that, then I would just be lying to your face. Eric, I'm sorry if I'm moving too much. Are you okay with this? Uh, okay. I was like, I know he, he usually has to follow around with it, and I'm a, I'm a mover. I, I try not to, but it, it happens. So, but if I was to sit up here and tell you that that was the case, then I would definitely be lying to you because it's not. 
You know, we face things, even as Christians, that your problems don't go away. Now, what changes is maybe the way that you handle them, the way that you deal with them, the way that you respond to certain situations, that changes. But even Paul said that we are persecuted from every side. So it wasn't like I was just being confronted by one person because we're not. We don't just have one problem in our life at a time. We have problems that come at us from every angle. And, and Paul even said that. Now, there are stages and periods in our life when things are calm. Things are good. I'm starting to walk into that stage now because I'm almost empty nest, which is very new for me, but I'm excited about it. Uh, I've got two left in the house. Got one graduating. Uh, well, I didn't give my ages, so we said 26, 22, and one a month away from being 18. God bless her so. She's the last one. So, you know, my wife and I are fixing to be in a different stage in our life. I'm looking forward to it. I know it's a lot cheaper when I go out to eat with me and her. <laughs> I can just put 20 bucks on the table and call it quits, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't have to spend $100 anymore when we go out to eat. It's like, oh, thank God, this is good. Still blessing me. But I've experienced trouble in my, in my Christian life, in my Christian walk. I, I, I mean, it, it hasn't been perfect. I've fallen. I've stumbled. I've messed up. I've made mistakes. But God has always been there to reach down and then pull me back up. And I thank him. I thank him for that. Glorify him. Praise him. So... Um, here I am. I've been going to church since, how old is my son? 26. For almost 25 years. How, well, we're, we're, yeah, we got married like right at 24. So right after we got, uh, we started going to church. And then the pastor said, hey, y'all need to quit living together. You need to get married. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's get married. And so I always say the pastor made me get married. Uh, he did. <laughs> he really did. So, but it was a good thing. We needed to, you know. I mean, we were comfortable just living together, and we already had a child. And, uh, but we made it right. We got married. And I apologize to my wife because she didn't get the wedding that she always wanted. And she reminds me of that constantly. <laughs> but uh, we are going to renew our vows next year. So you're all invited if you care to come. Uh, and, you know, we're going to uh, get Albert to do that for us. And uh, we just think it would make everything come into full circle since he was there in the beginning. And now we're together again. Um, so <clears throat> I do have my kids, like I said. I forgot where I was, and I apologize for that. But I'll get back on track. So things haven't always been easy as a Christian. Things have been tough, Okay. And uh, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I'm probably never going to make another mistake in my life because I know I will. Because God has given me this thing called free will, which allows me to make my own decisions, my own choices, while he sits back and he watches me. <laughs> and he's like, I know you're fixing this really just messed this up royally. <laughs> he said, but I'm going to let you do it. I'm going to watch you. Okay, that, that's enough. And then he's like, oh, going, okay, you're done, you're done, sit back, sit back. So it's kind of like, you know, we do that thing, uh, back, I don't even know when that was now, when the song came out, Jesus Take the Wheel, right? We try to control and run things ourselves without God, and we're like, oh, God, help me, Jesus, take the wheel. And then when he gets you back on track, you're like, okay, get out the way, I got it, I got it, here we go. <laughs> uh oh, you know, and then you know, I, I I've I've been in church long enough where I developed a, a third language and it's Christianese, and, and so I have I have a Christian word. Uh, you know, we always say that uh, those kind of people are crisis Christians. They only cry out to God when they're in a crisis, and uh, I personally know a couple of those in in my life, and uh, God bless them. I'm not giving up on them. Um, I'll continue to minister to them and love on them, and, uh, and I know that God's going to do something for them one day. So, I forgot that I am actually in control of the clicker, which I usually get to make fun of Albert during this part. It just, I knew it was going to work. It was right. Oh, the first time, 
is that way. Ooh. All right. All right. So what I'm going to do is that's a little bit about my life. And just so you know, like I said, I, I, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I never fail, that I'll never fail again, that my life is going to be perfect, peaches and cream, because I look around and I see some silver hair and I see some white hair and I see some no hair. And I know, I know that it's, it's not from things that have happened in your life while you're in that follicle situation. Um, but I love y'all. I've known y'all for a long time. So I have noticed I'm 47 now and I've got some gray coming in the side. I forgot that I had my cheaters on my shirt, so this is a new development. Whenever I get up and I read, I can see a mile away, but I can't see a foot in front of my face when it comes to reading, and that is new, and uh, it definitely takes some adjusting to get used to. I was like, hey, could you hold that back there <laughs> so I can see it? But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read a story for you. Um, out of the book of John in chapter 9. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read through it first and then we'll go back and, and we'll, we'll look at uh, some of the verses more in detail. And I think I got the same verse up there so I'll just read out of here. Same version. All right. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground, and he, he made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. So he went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. Therefore, I guess I'm supposed to be going through this. Uh, oh, you're kind of following me because you knew I was going to forget. Okay, keep following me, Eric. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? And the blind man said, I don't know. So, all right. So reading that. And I go back, and, and, and whenever I, I'm a little different, um, not sure why, but when I read the Bible, I have to envision it in a different way than most people. I wish they made adult pop-up Bibles where whenever you opened it, it was like the things would just pop up and it would be like seen from the Bible, but they don't. I've looked. Um, <clears throat> but I like to throw myself you know, so to speak, into the story. And I like to try to look at and envision the story from everybody's point of view in the, in the story. And then it helps me make sense of what's going on. It breaks it down a little bit for me. So in the beginning of uh, chapter 9, it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, isn't that just like Christian people? To say, this guy is living in sin. He has to be because he's having trouble in his marriage, so he must not be living right. Or... She's sick, so she must be in sin. You know, it, it's, I mean, why? Why do we do that? I've done it before. I've said, well, he must not be living right. You know, I mean, why do we do that? Is it human nature? Is it what? I don't know. Is it? Could it be? Maybe. <clears throat> 
But Jesus said, ha, ha, that's what I figured. He, was, he probably laughed at him first, like, no, you idiots. I think John left that out. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And then Jesus gets weird because he, he talks like that. He, 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 he talks in parables, which if you don't know what a parable is, he just kind of puts a story to something to try to make people understand it better. But then sometimes it's like he's talking way over here. And I'm like, what are you saying? You know, so I've looked it up, but I, I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, and I, I, cause, because we've heard the story about the blind man. And, and, and we've heard the detailed description of how he got healed. And that's, I say that tongue-in-cheek because it's not a detailed description on how he got healed. But what I want to do is I actually want to look at the journey that the man had to take for the healing. Okay? So, you know, and I said detailed description. It says, uh, um, yeah, hold on, let me get the glasses back on. All right, and I was like, ah, everything just crossed together. Um, go and wash. Uh, he went, right? That's, I know that's what it says. Anyways, he went and he was healed. That's the description. He went and he was healed. So are we just to assume that the journey was, it went smooth? Jesus just told a blind man to go, to walk somewhere? He's been blind since birth. He didn't know the cityscape. He didn't know the roads. He didn't know where the buildings were. He didn't know where that donkey was that day. Let me show you. I sure go the right way. I went backwards. Okay. We went through all this. And I should have been doing this during the whole time. Oh, good Lord. How long is this? Oh, that's small. Okay. Well, if you can see the map up here. We know, if, if, if you're familiar with the, the book of John, in chapter 8, Jesus is actually in the temple in the city of David, Jerusalem at the time. Um, he's in the temple, and I believe he, he had, uh, there's always confrontation when Jesus is around. I, I don't know if he does it on purpose or what, but that's, that's all right. So it, it, I think it was with the, the, the lady, and, and they were uh, threatening because she was caught in adultery, they were threatening to throw stones at her. And he said, you know, you who have no sin, throw the first stone. Then everybody left, and he scribbled in the dirt. I don't know what he said, but anyways. So with all that being said, we know that Jesus was in the temple, okay? So as he's leaving the temple is when they confront this blind man. And then Jesus, <clears throat> I'm going to leave that up there. And then Jesus you know, he gets asked the question by his disciples. They're kind of new in all this. They, you know, they're learning as they walk. And uh, so this is all new to them. So they ask him the question. And then Jesus tells them, you know, his whatever he told them. And then he gets down. And, you know, the, the blind man's not deaf, remind you. He's blind. So he hears all this going on. So and then Jesus gets down and he's like, I'm going to, uh, I am going to. Uh, he says that neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So when the blind man hears this, he's like, yeah, that's gonna, this is going to be good. And then Jesus goes, oh. I'm sorry, but it says, it says he spat. So I translate that to spit. Okay. Do you realize how much spit it would take to make mud? So he had to spit more than once, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. But you know, so when I, I was thinking, I mean, what was the blind man's reaction? I'm like, that's what I'm thinking that the, the blind man did was cover up because he was blind. He was a beggar, so surely he's been spit on before, you know, because people don't like people to beg. Especially back in that time when people had a, a disability, they were shunned. He was lucky to even be by the temple. I'm surprised that he was there, that they, that they didn't run him off. So I envisioned the blind man just covering up and cringing like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> but, but, but it never came, you know. And then he's probably thinking like, Ooh, he missed me. <laughs> 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 
But Jesus didn't miss him. He hit his intended target. So he gets down there. I think I can kneel down. I got these monitors off. I won't do it because you won't see me. So he, Jesus kneels down. And he spits in the mud or dirt. And he makes mud. And then he puts it onto the blind man's eyes. And the blind man's reaction. You know, imagine he had to pull back a little bit. Like, oh, what's going on? Have you ever, growing up, has your mama ever done this to you? <laughs> and then you smell her breath the rest of the day? <laughs> I call it Mama 409. That's what that is. So now, we know the blind man can't see, but we know he can hear and we know he can smell. So now he smells, it's holy spit. Okay, let's just say that. So it may, his breath probably didn't stink. This is Jesus that we're talking about. So he puts that mud on his eyes. So now he just went from bad to worse. Because now not only can he not see, he smells like Jesus' breath. He's dirty. Er, I'm sure he was, he was a blind beggar. He was probably dirty to begin with, but now he's dirtier because he's got these clumps of mud on his eyes. And then Jesus says, Go. Okay. You know, if I'm the blind man, I'm like, um, could you at least point me into the right direction? <laughs> you know, because the Bible doesn't say that the man, anybody went with him. It doesn't say that anybody went with him. It just says that he went. Now, we have to assume that somebody helped him. We do know that he didn't have a CNI dog. We know that because the ADA thing hadn't really happened back then. We know that he probably, he, he might have had a stick. But like I said, the man's been born, he, he was born blind. So he was blind. He didn't know the city. He didn't know, he didn't know where anything was. Somebody had to probably take him to the gate of the temple and set him down. And then Jesus says, go to the pool of Siloam and wash this mud off. And the blind man's like, okay. Uh, uh, where's the pool of Siloam? Well, let me show you. If you look at the map, it shows you where the temple is. And at the very bottom of the page, you'll see where it says Pool of Siloam. That is in the lower city, right inside of the gates. If you look, there's a little gauge there. So I've kind of figured out, I, I actually, I, I, uh, I consulted with a, a Baylor professor. And uh, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. So I was like, Eric, how far do you think that was? You know, so we, we've kind of come up with the conclusion it's probably somewhere between a third to a, a, a half a mile from the temple to the pool of Siloam. Why did Jesus make him go to that pool? If you look at the map, the pool of Beth Bethesda is right there. And there's already been a blind man healed at the pool of Bethesda. Do you remember? If you don't remember, is it, see, th this story doesn't even name this blind person. But the guy that was healed at the pool of Bethesda was Bartimaeus. That guy thought it was important enough to give us the name. But John didn't. But there's more to it. So Jesus could have sent the man to the pool of Bethesda. Um, I think I, I had another map, which I didn't give Eric. But there's a couple other pools in the city that were closer than the pool of Siloam. So Jesus sends a man who cannot see to the pool furthest away from him. Now, when I say pool, please don't get the visual that it was a swimming pool with a diving board and people in floaties and stuff like that because that's not what it was. This was the day before indoor plumbing, okay? So the way I envision this to be is like a bathhouse, but it's open bathing, okay? They actually discovered the Pool of Siloam in 2004 while they were uh, doing some uh, excavating for... A sewage line, I think is what they were doing. And uh, this is an artist's rendition of what the pool probably looked like because based on the structures that they have found, and this is the actual site. So it's pretty cool. Now this is just a part of it. I think they're still in the process of doing the excavation, believe it or not, even though they found it uh, beginning back in 2004. But when it comes to uh, uncovering ancient things like that, you have to take your time. 
to make sure and not mess up anything. So he sent the blind man to the pool to rinse off. And I'm like, what are you doing, Jesus? What? I, like, I'm, I don't understand. Why would you tell a blind man who doesn't know the city, doesn't know the roads, to go somewhere that he's never been, I'm assuming, and wash your eyes? What? I don't, I don't understand. So then I start thinking, of, well, it doesn't really describe what his journey was like. It just says that the man, he listened, he went, and he got healed. But I'm like, all right, put yourself in the blind man's position, okay? So now here you are. You can't see. Now you really can't see. can't even see shadows now because you can't see light, you know, because he put this spit mud on your eyes. <laughs> and it's starting to dry. You know, about a month ago, my wife is an esthetician, okay? For those of you that don't know what an esthetician is, it's a fancy word for somebody who cleans your face. So that's what she does for a living. And uh, so whenever she gets new products, I am the guinea pig. So, and then my skin was looking pretty rough. So she's like, you need an anti-aging hydration mask. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, let's do it. So we go in there. And she puts this mask on my face without warning me that, number one, I'm not going to be able to see. Number two, I'm not going to be able to breathe out my mouth. <laughs> and I'm a mouth breather because my nose is crooked, so I can't breathe out my nose. She doesn't give me these warnings. And I'm like, oh, you know, I reacted like the, like the, the blind man when, when Jesus started hawking that loogie up. And then she puts this Pudding. It's so it's thick. I don't even know how to describe it. She starts like she's icing a cake, you know. She starts putting it on my face. And the next thing you know, it's on my eyes. And she put it in my mouth and I can't talk. And it's very uncomfortable because now I'm kind of freaking out. I don't use she's the one that usually freaks out. I don't freak out. But I can't see. <laughs> I want to see. And I can't see. And, she, I'm, and I'm like, hmm, hmm. Mm -hmm. She's like, you're going to be okay, you know. <laughs> Just relax. Enjoy the moment, you know. I'm like, oh, my God. So I can't see, so I go, I'm going to open my eyes. <laughs> and I go, well, I thought I was opening my eyes, and I, I tried. I really did, but, you know, those muscles aren't the, the same going up. Well, the funny thing is, is when she took off the mask, you can see I tried to open my eyes <laughs> because, then, like, I had stretched it, you know. I was like, wow, my eyes look huge. But because I tried to open my eyes, I was trying to peek. But I freaked out. So here's the blind man. He's got this spit mud mask, okay. And he wasn't because of the, I didn't know Jesus was an esthetician, but I guess he was. So he's got this mud mask on his face now, right. And he is told to go so he's like okay so I am when I imagine when I imagine him going through the city the city of Jerusalem was busy at that time it was a main city there had to be people everywhere you know he bumped into some people you know he tripped and he fell and I'm sure he had to stop and say, hey, hey, I'm headed to uh, the pool of Siloam. Can you tell me how to get there? And, and, and people would be like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you see, you take a right over there. See where that building is? No, I'm blind. I don't, can you know, help me. So I'm assuming somebody probably had to come to the, the man's aid. But I know that the journey there wasn't easy. I know that he had to stumble. Okay, and that he had to fall a few times. But the middle of a miracle isn't always easy, and we don't always see that God is actually working in our favor, you know, while it's going on. It's not till after something happens, then we get back, and like we had talked about earlier, Monique, is that we have that aha moment. Aha. So when I was hearing about my childhood, and then after I'd been saved for a couple years, 
I looked back and I was like, aha, I see what God did there. Man, I was supposed to either be dead, incarcerated because I was Dennis the Menace, I promise you. I was supposed to be the one. I love my siblings. I love my mother and my father. I was supposed to be the one who married and divorced several times. And I turned out to be not the one. I'm the only one that's been married for this length of time. I thank God for that. But when you look at my life and how things were going, where I was headed, the way things, the way we think things should have been, that's what I was headed for. But God had a different plan for me. So the blind man, I see him, and I, I, this, is, this is the way I see him. I see him, I see him you know, stumbling. You know? I, I have a niece, and, and she's legally blind, and, and she can see shadows, and she can see light. When light changes, she can see that stuff. But she's legally blind. So, like, you know, you'll see her. She'll go, and then, boop, she amazes me because it's like I can't even walk through the living room at night go to the kitchen to get a drink of water without stubbing my toe. And I can see. So the blind man is going. And I know he's hitting stuff. I know he's, he's just stumbling. You just have to believe that. The Bible doesn't describe it that way, but you have to believe that. So the journey there wasn't easy. And it says that he, he went there. And when he got there, we, we see steps, right? There's steps surrounding the pool. So then the guy just had to stumble down the steps, and he probably just fell into the water, and you got all these people bathing there, and they see this guy with this scary-looking face, you know, with spit mud all over him, and he's getting into my bathing water. Um, you know, they've got to be freaking out. But I, I, I see it as the man is going on his journey that a crowd starts to develop, that people are, are watching, and they're following him, and they're realizing what's going on. And, you know, people love to see a great train wreck. You know, there's people out there that are still watching you, waiting for you to fall. You know, I'm sorry. There's people out there that would love nothing more than to see me fail. And I'll never give them that pleasure. I'll never give them that pleasure. And then, so I see the man, and, and he gets in the water, and I'm visualizing this. And he's, he's, he's washing and he's removing, and as he's removing, maybe some light starts coming in. And then he opens his eyes, and he, you know, he's never been able to see. So I see him, and he's starting to, the autofocus is starting to kick in. And, and he's starting, and like, well, hey, and, and, and that's a woman bathing, and that's cool. And I've never seen these things before. This is neat. This is sun. It's, a, you know, the bushes and the, and the, and the glistening on the water. That's, that's what I envision. <clears throat> but the journey there wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. And then I asked myself, okay, but where was the healing? Where, was, where did the healing take place? Was it in the mud? <laughs> was it in there? Is that where the healing was? Well, I, I thought to myself, no, because then he would have been able to see as soon as he put the mud on him. And then I'm like, well, was the healing in the water? Well, no, it couldn't have been in the water because then Jesus could have said, just go into the pool and bathe yourself. He's made that command before. He's healed that way before. Go and, and dip seven times, you know. Or Jesus could have just went, boom, you know what I mean, and just healed him. Or he could have just said, be healed, you know, because that's what Jesus can do. He has that power. But, but no, he, he, made him, he made him go through all that. So I'm led to believe that the healing wasn't in the mud. The healing wasn't in the water. The healing was in the stumbling. The healing was in his journey because the man had enough faith that when Jesus said, go, he went. And John makes it, he, John, he thinks it's important enough to tell us that the translation of Siloam is sent, and I, I just think it's maybe, you know, I don't know why John says that, but Jesus sent the man to a place called sent, so I don't know, anyways, 
So I think that that's where the healing was. The healing was actually in the journey because the man had enough faith to step out, to go. A lot of times we, you, me, are afraid to take that step because we're afraid to stumble. We're afraid to fall. We're afraid what people would say if we were to fall. I, I, I'm married into a boxing family. I love boxing. I love everything about it. And we have a saying that you don't lose the fight when you get knocked down. You lose if you don't get up. The same can be translated and related to our Christian walk. You don't lose when you take that step. You don't lose if you stumble. You don't lose if you fall. You lose if you don't get up, if you don't try. But even if you don't get up, I, I promise you, there's times where God would reach down, and the Bible says in that miry clay, and just pull you up and rescue you. <clears throat> so I think the healing was in the stumbling. How many times have you stumbled? Now, I know I've stumbled a lot, and I, stu I still stumble from time to time. Now, just because the man stumbled, does it mean that he wasn't sent? No, doesn't mean that, because Jesus sent him, but he stumbled. Now, just because I stumble as a Christian, just because you stumble as a Christian, does that mean that God didn't send you to do something? Does that mean that God didn't call you to be in children's ministry? Does that mean that God didn't call you to one day be up in, uh, on the worship team and singing? Just because you stumble? No, that doesn't mean that at all. God can use a donkey, he can use you. He used me, and he's still using me. Just because you stumble and you fall doesn't mean that you're not sent. This man was sent. The guy had to be afraid. The guy had to have some fear. Even though he took a step of faith, there had to be a little ounce of disbelief. Because a lot of times I'm like that. I'm like, all right, act on macho. Let's do it. Let's go. And, and you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, I hope this works out. I hope we don't. You know, I hope I, I hope I don't fall. I hope I don't fail. I hope I don't get killed. You know. But things usually work out. Thank God. You know what I mean? So there had to be some fear in the man. But then, after he was healed, <clears throat> after he was healed and he came back seeing, now how many know that the journey back was different than the journey there? Because it was. He could see. When he came back, therefore, the neighbors, whoop, let's see if I can do this for y'all. Oh, Lord, we, this is long, ain't it? Ooh. Oh, okay. Oh, well, Eric, you can find it for me, please. <laughs> so, therefore, we are in <clears throat> verse 8. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is this not the man who sat and begged? Some said, it is he. Others said, nah, it's like him. It's his doppelganger, but it's not him. And the blind man, who was blind, but now you can see, is like, no, nah, it's, it's me. It's me, baby. It's, it's me. That was, that was me. I was the guy. I was the guy. And see, and there's, there, and there's people out there. There's people out there when they say, isn't that the guy who used to be in gangs? Isn't that the guy that used to always be shooting up, doing drugs, and just in, in, in and out in jail? Isn't that the guy? And uh, Why? Why do people do that? You know what I mean? Isn't that the lady who, who has been in so many different relationships? 
You know, we do that as Christian people. Not all of us, but we do that. But why? Why do we do that? Even here, they say, isn't that the man? And when the man is saying, no, yeah, it's me. I'm right here. Hey, hello. It's me. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes open? And the man answered and he said, a man called Jesus. So they asked how. And they asked him like three or four times, how? How? And his answer was a who? It was Jesus. So, you know, I was thinking, but why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus make a spectacle of the man? Why did he spit in the ground when he could have just touched him and put the mud on his eyes and then, you know, slapped him in the back and sent him on his way to Salome and he didn't even know how to get there? And then the crowd of people were watching and, the, and they were following him. Why, 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 did, why did Jesus do that? When he could have made it so much easier like he did in other stories. And then I started thinking, well, maybe it's because Jesus wanted everybody that saw the man broken to see him healed. To see the transformation. You know, because when people look at who you were before. And they know the things that you've done before in your past. And then when Jesus gets a hold of you and he turns your life around, and then people are like, is that the man who used to? Yes, it was. That was me. It is me. So I'm just here to encourage you today <clears throat> to don't give up in a stumble. When you're going somewhere and you feel like God has sent you not to give up in the stumble. Now, why did Jesus do that? Why did, why, why did he do that? I'm, I love, and then it's like, well, because he, he wants everybody that saw you fail or saw you hurt to see you miraculously healed and brought back up and things restored to your life. Because when something is as bad as your life was, when you were incarcerated, when you were strung out on drugs, that when you finally came back around, the only answer, the only explanation could be a man named Jesus. That could be the only answer. That's why he let people see you fall. That's why he... He, 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 he let people see what you're going through. Okay? So don't give up in the stumble, guys. Don't give up in the stumble. The blind man didn't give up. And I, I've never even looked at this story from this point of view. Because, you know, it, the, the, the John doesn't elaborate on it. It just says, that, yeah, the man, he went and he, he washed off and he, and he got healed. He was able to see. But don't give up in the stumble. Because sometimes the miracle is in the stumbling. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word that you've given me today, Lord. And, and I thank you for everybody that was here to hear it. Father, I thank you for, for blessing us with your presence today, Father God, for the wonderful worship, Father. Father, we know that sometimes, Lord God, that we, we want to give up and we just want to quit, Father. Because it's hard to continue to walk when you're stumbling. But Lord, if we'll just hang on and we'll continue to press forward and continue to walk out this journey with you, Father God, that everything will be fine in the end and that the only explanation could be a man named Jesus. Father, we give you glory and we give you the honor. I pray for a safe return for our pastors. And for the other people that are on that journey with them, Lord, we give you the glory and the praise and the honor, Father God. And we thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country. Lord, I just pray that you just be with each and every single one of us as we walk out this journey of life, Father God. That you be with us as we go to work. 
you be with us as we are at home doing what we do or whatever it is, Father God, that you just be with us, Father, that you anoint our steps, you anoint our words, and Father, we give you all the glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, don't forget that we have service on Wednesdays, and we have a potluck, um, so if you want to show up a little bit early, please feel free to do so. Thanks for coming today, thanks for hearing my heart. Hearing a little bit of my testimony, I appreciate it. I hope that we can still be friends. Um.